Okay, for year 11 structured question one, we've got figure 1.1, which shows the speed time graph for a vehicle accelerating from rest. So the question asks us to calculate the acceleration of the vehicle at time 30 seconds. So if we have a look at the graph, we can see that it is a curved graph. Um, so we're going to have to use a tangent for that curve. Because the acceleration is changing, we know that it's highest at the start and lowest at the end. We need to take a tangent for the time that it's asked for. So if we find 30 seconds, then 30 seconds is here. So we need to draw a tangent to the curve at that point. So I'm taking my ruler and lining it up with the curve at that point so that it's 90 degrees at that point which gives me a, curve, a tangent something like that so I'm just going to get rid of this okay so now I use my tangent line find the gradient and that will give me the change in speed over time so if I have a look on here, I'm going to use this point. So from here, which is at 27, down to, I'm going to go from this point. So that's at 6, and at, if that is 20, 20 divided by 5, so that's going to be at 4 seconds. So then, I've got from 4 seconds to 68, which is a difference of 64 on my x-axis, and then on my y-axis, that value is 25, 6, 27, 28, um, but I'm coming from 6, so I've got 28 minus 6, which is going to give me 22. My gradient is going to be difference in y over the difference in x, which is equal to 22 over 64, which gives me 0 0.34. Um, and we know that that's meters per second per second. So it's going to be 0 0.34 meters per second squared. For part B, it then says, without any further calculation, state how the acceleration at time 100 seconds, so that's here, compares to the acceleration at time 10 seconds, so that's here. Suggest in terms of force a reason why any change has taken place. Well, just by looking at the curve, we can see that, let me rub this out so we can see a bit better. So we've got 10 seconds and uh, 100 seconds. So just by looking at it, we can see that the graph is steeper at 10 seconds than it is at 100. And we know that the gradient is equal to the acceleration. That's what we've just worked out. So we know that the acceleration is less at 100 seconds. So let's write that first off. If I can scroll down. Okay, so we know that it's less at, uh, so it's less 100 seconds than at 10 seconds. Suggest in terms of force a reason why this change has taken place. So from motion, um, we should be sort of thinking, and it's, it's getting to this point up here, about terminal velocity, perhaps. So what happens as an object increases its speed? Um, it's going to increase the air resistance. Okay, so the air resistance increases, so the air resistance has increased.
which means that it's going to be reducing the resultant force. Because let's say we have 100 newtons of force forwards from the engine, um, and then we've got zero air resistance initially, so that means that the acceleration is going to be high. And then as the speed increases, the air resistance increases. And so let's say at this point, let's say it's got um, 100 newtons from the engine going forward, but 90 newtons from the air resistance going in the opposite direction. So the overall resultant is going to be 10 newtons, which is less than it was at the start. And so that air resistance has increased, which means that the resultant force, the accelerating force, is less. The final part then, part C, says determine the distance travelled by the vehicle between time 120 seconds and 160 seconds. So let's have a look at when that is and let's clear our graph. So at 120 seconds that's at this point and 160 seconds that's at this point. So a speed time graph, to calculate the distance we need to have the area under the graph. So the area under the graph is going to give us the distance of travel, mm -hmm. distance that it's travelled. So we want this area essentially. Now to calculate that, there's a couple of different ways you could do it. So you could use the trapezium rule, um, but what I will uh, would actually do is I would use split this up into two shapes. So I've got a triangle here, and I've got a uh, rectangle here. So from this rectangle, I know that I've got 20 times by, and so it's actually from from here, right? 120, so 20 times by uh, 40, which is going to give me this area. But I also need this area here. So to calculate that, I need to do the change in height, which is in this case 10 and 40 again. But because it's a triangle, I need to then divide that by 2. So 40 times by 20. plus 10 times by 40 divided by 2 because it's the triangle at the top. So if I plug that into my calculator I get 800 plus 200 which gives me 1,000, just double check, that is metres, so it's 1,000 metres. Okay, that's the question one. Okay, for Year 11 Structured Question 2, we have been given figure 2.1, which shows a forklift truck lifting a box. So it says, the electric motor that drives the lifting mechanism is powered by batteries. State the form of energy stored in batteries. So this is sort of essential facts that we need to recall. Um, different types of energy stores that we can have. And for batteries, we need to recall that that is chemical energy. So the way that batteries work is they've got two chemicals inside of them and when they are connected via a circuit what can happen is electrons will flow through the circuit which causes a chemical reaction to take place inside of the battery um, and so energy is transferred that way um, but it is a chemical energy store that's in the battery um, it te technically is chemical potential energy but chemical um, is fine let's, let's put the proper one now Question part B, the lifting mechanism raises a box of mass 32 kilograms through a vertical distance of 2.5 meters in four seconds. Calculate the gravitational potential energy gained by the box. So you saw I underlined some of the values as I was going through the question there um, and that just makes it easier for me to spot them as I go back to them later. 
So for gravitational potential energy, um, the key thing, core knowledge that you need to understand or that you need to recall is the gravitational potential energy formula. And so that is that the GPE, gravitational potential energy, can be calculated by doing the mass times by the gravitational field strength times by the height that it's moved through. This actually comes from the uh, work done, work equals force times by distance equation, um, whereas mg is going to give you the weight, which is the force, and the height that it's moved is going to give you the distance. In this case, we're given the mass, we're given the height, so we're given these two values, we need to remember what g is on the Earth. Now actually, um, that should be, I believe, on your data sheet. Um, if not, you need to remember that value is g equals 10 newtons per kilogram. So plugging into this equation, we've got GPE is equal to 32 times by 10 times by the height that's moved which is 2.5 meters. Now we don't actually need to use this value for this part of the question. Okay, um, So if we plug that into a calculator we get that the value for GPE is 800 joules. So there's two marks. One mark is for the formula and the substitution the other mark is then for the final answer with a unit. For B part 2, it says the efficiency of the lifting mechanism is 0.65 or 65%. Calculate the input power to the lifting mechanism. So immediately we're seeing efficiency in the question. We should be thinking of our efficiency formula. So the efficiency is given by total, sorry, it's given by the useful. output out of total input so and that can be applied to both energy and power so the question is asking is for the input power so we're looking for this value the total input power it gives us the efficiency so 0.65 and it is not given as the output, okay, but it tells us that it's 65% of the input. Now, we actually know what the gain in gravitational potential energy is uh, from the previous question. We know that it gains 800 joules, and we also know, going back to this time, that it's in 5.4 seconds. So the power is equal to the energy over time. So the energy that it gains in this, ex this situation is 800 joules and it does that in 5.4 seconds. So we can calculate what the output power must be by doing 800 divided by 5.4, which is going to give me 148.148 watts, joules per second. So now we can plug that into our efficiency equation. So we know that 0 0.65 is equal to 14. 8 divided by input. So rearranging that, we're going to end up with input input is equal to 148 divided by 0 0.65, which is equal to 230 watts, thereabouts.
The final part of the question is the batteries are recharged from a mains voltage supply that is generated in an oil-fired power station. By comparison with a wind farm, state one advantage and one disadvantage of running a power station using oil. So there are a few different advantages and disadvantages um, that we can choose from here. Um, but the main advantage that oil has over wind is that it doesn't rely on the wind. You can burn oil at any weather situation. So if it's windy outside, if it's sunny outside, if it's rainy outside, if it's nighttime, daytime, whenever that is, you can um, burn oil. So that is the main advantage. It is not dependent on the weather um, and it's not dependent on the wind blowing. So it's not dependent on the weather or you could say it's always available. Now just be careful with the always available that you don't mix up the, the ideas um, which goes into what is a disadvantage. So a disadvantage of oil over wind is that it's non-renewable. So oil will eventually run out. It will eventually be unavailable. Um, but in the context here what this means is that it's always available if we've got a supply of it, it's always available to be burnt um, to generate electricity. So in the disadvantages, there's a few. Uh, most people got this right, that it is polluting. Um, it releases uh, CO2, um, which leads to greenhouse gassing, or greenhouse, which is a greenhouse gas, or leads to global warming. Um, or it is non-renewable. Most people got this second part of the question right. Um, the first part is where people um, didn't quite give the right advantage. A lot of people said it's cheaper. Um, it's not actually any cheaper now to use oil than it is to produce a wind farm or to make a wind farm. Um, the costs are about equivalent now because of the rise in oil prices and the uh, decrease in manufacturing costs for producing wind turbines. So cost is not a factor um, that we can talk about in this sort of question anymore. Okay, that's it for question two. Okay, question three. So a light, uh, sorry, a ray of light in air is instant on a glass block. So that's just so we can think about this. Here's the glass, the surrounding is air. And when we say incident, that means it meets. So it's gonna look something like that. There's our light ray. Um, and it says the light changes direction. If you remember, you should see something like that inside the glass. So we're asked for the name of the effect. The name of it is refraction. And then you're asked for the cause of the effect. Um, now, a number of you said that glass is more dense than air, but that didn't actually get you a mark. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why it didn't get you a mark. First of all, it doesn't necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be more dense physically. It has to be optically dense. So, optical density. What that means is that light travels more slowly. And it's that change in speed as it goes from air to glass that causes the change in direction. So what we were looking for for the cause of the effect is a change in speed of light. Or you could have said a uh, change in refractive index. But the key thing is the idea that it's the speed or the refractive index that is changing. If you're ever stuck to remember what, uh, how that works, what you can imagine is a car. So this is a car, and I've just drawn little dashes here to show the four tires of the car. As the car runs from the air into the glass, it's going to slow down, because we know that light travels more slowly in glass. But on this side, 
this one will be in air still, while this side will be in the glass. So what will happen is this side over here will travel faster, so that will cause it to curve round. So if, you're ever not, if, you're never, if you're ever unsure of which way something changes, um, you can always just pretend that a car is driving from, say, a road onto sand and think about which way, as each wheel hits, which way would the car move. Then a nice classic lens question. So you're uh, shown to full scale, uh, showing a thin converging lens of focal length 3.5 centimeters. And the first thing you're asked to do is to label the two principal focuses with the letter F. So principal focuses are the focal points on both sides. So they are where, if I was to shine in parallel beams of light, something like this, into my lens, they would all cross and go through that focal point. Um, and some of you got a little bit confused between parallel beams of light and beams of light coming in at other angles. We'll talk about that in a minute. To get the marks, what I'm looking for is these uh, crosses to be marked clearly, and they had to be labelled with the letter F. Um, and then in the marking, um, I am checking to make sure that it is 3.5 centimetres measured with a ruler on both sides. I do appreciate it's a little bit tricky to do this using the scale on the graph, um, on, the, on the graph paper, um, so just use a ruler when you get a question like that. Obviously in the real thing, um, usually the uh, scale on the graph will match up with actual centimetres, but just be aware of that. You then told an object O, here's the object O up here, um, of height 4.4 centimetres, it's placed 7.5 centimetres from the lens. Now it says it's drawn to full scale, so if you measure this, this should be 4.4 uh, centimetres, and this distance should be uh, 7.5 centimetres. You may find it slightly different because of printing, but it shouldn't be. You're then asked to determine the height of the image. So the image is going to form somewhere over here, and we need to construct a ray diagram to show that. So um, if you go on my YouTube channel, there are other videos where I go into detail about how to uh, draw ray diagrams, but basically we're looking for something like this. The first ray you're going to draw should go uh, across the page uh, and it should go from the tip of object O to the lens. To make it a bit thicker so you can see. The next uh, thing you're going to draw So let me do that. The next thing I'm going to draw um, is continue that ray. Now that ray... All right, so another waves question for you now. Yeah, you're showing wave fronts approaching a barrier in a gap, and you're asked to draw three wave fronts to the right of the barrier. First thing you need to know is that this phenomenon that's going on is diffraction. So diffraction is the spreading out of waves after a barrier. Now, if you notice here... The gap between the waves, as we know, is the wavelength lambda. Um, and I can see that the gap that the waves are passing through is about the same as lambda. So what that tells me is I'm going to get maximal diffraction. So it's going to look like a full circle, like that. Now. One of the things that you need to remember is that during diffraction, the wavelength doesn't change. So what I'm looking for is the wavelength here that I've marked in red should be the same as this wavelength in blue. That was for one mark. And the second mark was for at least, uh, so, sorry, so the marks are for the same wavelength. And the mark was for a minimum of three um, and all semicircles. Um, or 45 degrees. So in other words, this angle and this angle had to be at least 45 degrees uh, to show that. 
Uh, figure 6.2 shows a gap in the barrier increased five times the previous gap. So now you're asked to draw three wave fronts. So again, I want my wave fronts to be about the same uh, distance. And the key thing is that in the region of the gap over here, they should be straight. And then they should curve a little bit outside it. So it should be straight and then curve at the edges. So it's going to look something like that. That's what I was looking for. Again, same wavelength. Um, I'm looking for uh, straight uh, in the middle and curved at the edges. Okay, review uh, diffraction if you're unsure about that. They also describe with a label diagram an experiment that uses water waves to show reflection, reflection of uh, wave fronts that occur at a straight barrier. So quite a number of you um, accidentally talked about diffraction some more. So the classic experiment is something like this. The basic idea is we have a trough or a container full of water. Um, and what we have inside it is some kind of beam attached to a motor. So we'd have a battery running that. Um, and you could just write, you just annotate this, um, a motor uh, moves the beam up and down, generating waves. Um, and we need to make sure we label our diagram, so we'll call this a dipper or beam. And inside this uh, trough of water, I need a long barrier. And the barrier must be deeper than the waves, sorry, deeper than the water, or the top is above the water. And then what I could do is draw what the waves will do. So the waves will come up like this, and then they'll reflect and go like this. So I could also draw incident Ways. Remember, incident means incoming. And I could also draw the reflected waves like that. Um, and then the last thing I need is some way of observing this. So the classic way is underneath you have a light bulb. And you look at it from above. So I could draw an eye like that. Looking down at it. So you could say observe the waves. Now so in the mark scheme, um, there was one mark for a label diagram. There was one mark for showing in the way, showing in the diagram the reflected waves. Um, there was one mark for having it full of water. There was a mark for producing the waves. There was a mark for some kind of information about the barrier, like it being deeper than the water or it being made of wood or metal. Um, and there is a mark for saying how you will observe the waves, up to a total of four. Um, 
just get yourself familiar with a ripple tank. Um, it does come up a couple of times in the exam, so it's worth just being familiar with it. All right, question five. We've got a circuit diagram. And the circuit consists of three resistors and three identical 1.5 volt cells. So let's draw that straight onto the diagram so that it's really simple. And then you're asked to take the total electromotive force of the three cells in series. So the fact that they're in series means I can just add them together. So I get 1.5 plus 1.5 plus 1.5, which gives me 4.5 volts. Then asked to calculate the combined resistors of the two resistors in parallel. To do that, I'm going to need the formula 1 over the total resistance is 1 over the resistance of the first, plus 1 over the resistance of the second, and so on and so forth for however many resistors I have. In this case, I've only got two, so I can say 1 over the total resistance is 1 over 60 plus 1 over 30. Uh, so let me just grab a calculator, which I don't have, um, but I'm going to say that RT is 1 divided by 1 over 60 plus 1 over 30, which comes to 20 ohms. Now, a lot of you forgot about the 1 over RT being that total. So just think about it logically. If I've got two different paths that the current can take, the total resistance should be lower than the resistance through either of these because there's less, there's, there's, if, there's more, it's a, yeah, if there are more paths that the electrons can take, the overall resistance of the circuit will be lower. Um, but I wouldn't expect something vanishingly tiny. Yeah? So if you get something in the 0, 0.00 range, that's probably too small. Then you're asked for the total resistance of the circuit. So what I can do is I can rewrite this circuit. So far it looks like this. I've said that these two 60 and 30 ohms together become a 20 ohm. And I've still got my 55 ohm here. So I just need to find the total resistance. So I just need to add these together. So I just want 20 plus 55 gives me 75 ohms of resistance. Uh, and then you're asked to find the current in the 55 ohm resistor. Um, so to do that, we are going to use uh, V is IR. So the first thing I need to find, uh, well, let's think about what the current's going to do. If we think about uh, Kirchhoff's first law, I can say that the sum of the currents entering a node is equal to the sum of the currents leaving it. In other words, what I've done was I've said that this circuit is exactly the same as a circuit like that with 75 ohms there. Um, and I know that around this circuit all the way the current will be identical. So all I need to do is say, well, if I had this imaginary 75 ohm resistor, what would be the current? Because that would be the same current as through the 55. So I can say that res uh, sorry, I is equal to V over R. In this equivalent circuit, I've got a voltage of 4.5 ohms. So that's 4.5 over a total resistance of 75 which comes to 0 0.060. And don't forget your units, amps. The currents in the 30 ohm, the 55 ohm, and the 60 ohm are all different. State, that means just say, the resistance of the resistor in which the current is the largest. So again, look at it this way. Think about Kirchhoff's first law. I know that in the 55 ohm resistor, um, that's going to be all of the current, so that will be 0 0.60 amps. And then I've got a higher resistance here and a lower resistance here. So I know that if I call this I1 and this I2, I can say that I1 plus I2 is equal to 0. Uh, sorry, it should be 0 0.06, shouldn't it? 0 0.060 amps. Let's put a zero in there. Um, 
so some of the current will go into the six, through the 60 ohm, some of the current will go through the 30 ohm. But immediately I can see that neither of those um, will be as big as what was through the 55 ohm. So my answer is that most current goes through the 55 ohm resistor. Okay, question number six is a magnetism question. Okay, and it's about um, demagnetization of uh, bar magnets. Okay, so it's three marks, which leads us to indicate there's probably something wrong here. Okay, because um, it's kind of a weird question for them to ask if the answer is just yes. Okay, so we're looking at these steps they've done and we're seeing where might they have gone wrong. Um, and where they've gone wrong here is they've, um, they've switched off the current before they've removed the bar from the coil. Okay, so the first mark on this question is uh, for stating um, no, or this will not be effective. Okay, so that's our, our first mark there. Okay, so no. Um, but there's now two marks, because this is a three mark question, okay, um, for the explanation. Okay, so I've seen it's a state, done that, and I've got to explain. Okay, so the issue with this is that um, kind of the, what I would say is, is the fix, um, I would just say, explain why it wouldn't work, is um, um, no, and I would say um, the bar um, or the um, magnet okay, should be removed um, before the current is switched off. Okay, so it's kind of uh, no, because these steps aren't the right around. Why is this the case? Okay, well, the reason this is the case, and there's a couple of marks you can get for this as well, for explaining it, is that when the bar magnet is inside the coil, the poles are constantly flipping, and if you turn off the current, they'll be just stuck in one of those orientations where they're either all facing one way or all facing in the opposite direction but they will all be lined up. However, if you pull it out whilst the coil is still alternating, okay, that means the um, domains that have exited will be pointing in one direction, and the domains that are still in the coil will still be being jumbled around. Okay? So this means as it's removed, they all end up in different directions. So you just need to remember, in terms of this question, the steps, and the steps you need to remember are you must remove the magnet from the coil before you turn off the current. Okay, then the second part is on our um, DC uh, motor. Okay, so we can see this has a split ring. Okay, just like a DC motor should. It's got a coil in and it's got a magnet. Okay, so we know a DC motor um, um, is going to spin. Okay, it's a DC motor diagram. We know what motors do, they spin. So the first mark, and this is again a three mark question, so I'm thinking three things. So the first thing is state the motion of the coil. Well, I'm gonna say it's gonna turn or um, spin. Okay, that's my first mark. Second mark um, is kind of giving a bit more detail actually on this spin. Okay, so there's kind of um, two ways you could have got this mark. Um, because it's got a split ring, that coil is actually going to keep spinning in the same direction over and over. So you could have either talked about here the fact that it would be uh, continuously um, spinning, or you could talk about the fact what direction is it going to spin. So here I'm going to have to use a little bit of Fleming's um, left hand rule okay, to work this out. So first thing is current is going to point from north to south. Okay, and then I've got the um, battery. Well, the battery flows from positive to negative. How do I know which one's positive? The long line on my cell symbol is positive. 
the short line is negative. The way I remember that is a positive is made up of two lines. So if I put them both together, it would make a long line. Whereas a negative is just one line, so it only makes a short line. Okay, so I know my current is going to be flowing out this way. And then my current is going to be flowing this way on that side and this way on that side. So then I'm going to use Fleming's left-hand rule. Okay, and you're going to remember Fleming's left-hand rule. Okay, which finger is this? Okay, so FBI. So F stands for force. Okay, B stands for magnetic fields. Okay, and um, I stands for current. So I'm going to then line that up in the directions of these. And you can see if I do that, um, I've actually lined this up quite nicely with uh, this situation here. And I can see that the magnetic field is going that way. The current is going that way on that side. So the force will be upwards on this side. So if the force is upwards on this side, my magnet is going to be turning this way, which is clockwise. Okay, so here I'm going to say clockwise. Okay, so clockwise turns, I'm going to turn clockwise. And then it says uh, explain. I haven't really explained at this stage yet. So I'm going to now talk about um, an explanation. Okay, so why does it turn? Well, um, it turns because there is a, we know because of Fleming's left hand rule. Okay, we go uh, left hand rule means there is a force on a uh, current, okay, carrying wire in a magnetic field. Okay, that kind of explains um, why it, uh, it turns. The other thing we can talk about is why is this a continuous turn? And the other thing we can talk about, well, this is a DC motor. Oh, it's cut off. That doesn't want me to write over there. Okay, and um, this is a DC motor. So um, I'll put it up here then, whatever. Um, this is a DC motor. So it's going to keep spinning because um, the um, current flips direction each half turn. Okay, so because there is a um, split ring, the other thing we could write about here is um, current changes direction every half turn. Okay, so back up to the diagram. Why is that the case? Well, as we got, as this spins in the diagram, the split ring will swap the terminals round. So the current swaps round in the coil. That keeps these forces in the same direction and keeps it spinning constantly. Okay. Final part of this uh, question then. Sorry. I kind of lost where we were. There we go. Okay, final part of this question. Um, it asked me about the... Um, it asked me to get rid of this out of the way. So it's asking me about the um, turning effect, how powerful it will be. And we know there's kind of three things that affect the turning effect. That's the current in the coil, yeah, the magnetic field strength, and the number of turns. All of these increase the turning effect. So here we can see I have four times the current of the first example here. Okay. So I've got four times the current. We know current increases the um, turning effect because more current means there'll be a stronger force. So this will be four times as large. This was answered pretty well. Second one, current is unchanged from before. Magnetic field strength is unchanged. But the number of turns is now double as much. Okay, so I've got double the number of turns. I'm going to double the force. Okay, last one. Number of turns is unchanged. Current in the coil is unchanged. But the magnetic field strength is half as strong as before. Okay, so what that means is that the turning effect is going to be a half what it was before. Okay, 
And that's the total for our nine marks. Moving on to question number seven. Okay, so question seven, um, we've got a piece of apparatus and they're asking us, um, she wants to investigate good and bad absorbers of thermal, and key thing here, radiation. She has the apparatus, a supply of cold water, and a meter ruler. Okay, so we're going to think about why do we need the cold water, why do we need the meter ruler, and we need to make sure this experiment is tailored towards radiation. So explain how she should use uh, the apparatus and describe the results she would expect to obtain. Draw a diagram of the setup. Okay, so one thing lots of people missed was this bit here. Describe the results you would expect to obtain. Everyone drew the diagram. So let's first of all draw the diagram. Okay, so there's a first mark is actually for the diagram. And what we want, they've shown us what they want us to, us to how to draw it. So we've got the electric heater. Okay, and then we've got our polished cans. Okay, so um, up to you how you drew this. But really what we needed was just the idea that we had one can uh, some distance away and one can the same distance away as well. Could have been on the same side, could have been on one side, okay. Really in a diagram, everything should be labeled. So I'm gonna label this heater, gonna label this uh, polished can, gonna label this uh, black can, okay. Um, so my heater's in the middle and then there's some distance with these. And I'm going to use that meter ruler they suggested, okay, and I'm going to just have my meter ruler here, meter ruler here, and that's just to uh, look at the distances between these um, cans and the heater. Okay, so there's one mark for this, okay, then three more marks, second mark is for... Um, adding um, the idea about how we're going to measure the um, temperature. Okay, so in these cans, I am going to need a um, thermometer. Okay, in both cans to measure the tea. And also, what I actually need to include is the cold water in these. Okay, they've asked us, they've mentioned the cold water in the previous part, supply of cold water. Okay, I'm gonna actually include that here. So, Second mark, um, my method now. Okay, place uh, both cans 50 centimeters. I'm gonna be specific as I can from heater. Okay, and then gonna say, be specific again with the amount of water I include. Um, put 200 milliliters of cold water in each can. Okay, and I could be even more specific. I could say, how do I do that? Using a measuring cylinder. Okay, and then um, place thermometers in cans and measure uh, temperature at start, and then I'm going to turn on the heater and measure temperature after, um, let's say, two minutes. Okay, so I've just been very specific with all the things I'm going to do distance, um, the time, the amount of water, because those all could be worth marks. Okay, so the one the second mark was for placing my thermometers in the water. Okay, um, so I've talked about the cold water, I've talked about the thermometers, that's the second mark. The third mark is for some good detail. Okay, so they've given marks here for cans and equal distance from the heater, tick. Um, they've given a mark for same volume of water, tick. Okay, one way of going at that. And the other thing they gave it for was for the thermometers in the same positions in the cans. So you could have talked about clamping those thermometers in the cans. Okay, this is still now only three marks. Okay, the fourth mark is for this bit here, describing the results you would expect to obtain. Okay, and here we're going to obtain which one is the better um, 
absorber of thermal radiation and you should know from um, your vision that the black can is the better absorber. So the black can is absorbing more heat from the heater, it will reach a higher temperature. So what will I expect? Fourth mark, higher temperature on black can. And that's how I get four marks. Thank you. Okay, question eight. So we've got an uncharged conducting metal plate rests on insulating supports. Figure 10.1 shows the plate and a positively charged insulating plastic sheet placed on top of the metal plate. And you're asked to describe any flow of charge that takes place when the plastic sheet is placed on top. So, in the metal plate, electrons are free to move. because it's conducting. So what happens is electrons move towards the plastic sheet. And we know that's the case because uh, the negative electrons will be attracted to the plastic sheet. Now, you have to say the word move to get the mark. It's not enough just to say attracted. Attraction is just a force. But we need the idea that those electrons will actually move to the top. Um, and obviously, you couldn't say that uh, negative charge moves um, because uh, that... Sorry, we couldn't say that positive charge moves because the positive charge is the atoms themselves and the atoms in a solid are fixed in place. So it had to be the electrons that were moving. We then asked to draw how the charges are now arranged in the plate. Now the mark scheme was a little bit um, lenient. So basically what I was looking for was the idea of there being negative charges near the plastic sheet and positive charge towards the bottom. Because if those electrons have moved, they've left behind net positive charge. Now, the mark scheme didn't penalise you for this, but remember, if you're drawing charges on something that started off uncharged, the total object should still be uncharged. So on your work, check that you should have the same number of minuses and pluses because overall the metal sheet should still have an overall zero charge. Like I said, they didn't penalise you on this question, but in the future they could. I've been asked to state and explain if this arrangement of charge helps to keep the plastic sheet in place. Again, a state and explain. So the answer is yes, it does. Um, and the reason is um, because the uh, unlike charges will attract. So because I've got more negative charge towards the top of the plate, that's going to attract the positive charge in the plastic sheet, and that attraction will hold them together. Figure 10.2 shows two uncharged conducting spheres suspended on insulating threads. The spheres are now given positive charges. Draw a possible position of each sphere and thread. So again, I was a little bit lenient sometimes, but what I was looking for was the two, the two uh, objects moving apart from each other. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, sorry, like charges repel. And because both of them have positive charge, they're going to repel each other. Okay, question nine. Figure 2.1 shows a sign that extends over a road. They then give you a diagram uh, showing you perpendicular distances and the line of action of the weight of the sign. Uh, part A asks you to calculate the weight of the sign. It says the mass of the sign is 3.4 times 10 to the 3 kilograms. Now, you can also see it's worth two marks. Uh, 
and so don't be caught off guard there's obviously going to be two things that you need to do the first thing is obviously state the equation w equals mg weight is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration due to gravity and g is always 10 seconds squared at IGCSE uh, so therefore w is the mass which they give you here above sorry 3.4 times 10 to the 3 and multiply by that by 10 so not too difficult there 3.4 times 10 to the 4 but you need the unit Newton uh, to get your second mark so your first mark comes from uh, your equation your second mark comes from your value with a correct unit uh, I'm just going to see if the new pen writes a bit thinner is that better hopefully okay uh, the weight of the sign acts at a horizontal distance of 1.8 meters from the center of the support post and it produces a turning effect about point P so before I even carry on reading anything else I'm going to scroll back and I'm going to locate point P and I'm just going to highlight it with a cross so everything we're looking at um, the moments are occurring about that pivot point there and that's really important to have correctly identified so point P is a horizontal distance of 1.3 meters from the center of the support post calculate the moment about P due to the weight of the sign that's important so that's the force we're interested in uh, so you get one mark for stating the equation either in uh, symbols or words so you can have fx or you can have force multiplied by the perpendicular distance to the pivot Ooh, can't spell so that's worth one uh, so then obviously you've already worked out the force because that is the weight and you got that in part a you will have got a carried error if you calculated the weight wrong, but not many people did that. So I have 3.4 times 10 to the 4. And then I need to multiply that by the perpendicular distance uh, to the pivot. This is where people went a little bit wrong. So I'm just going to scroll back up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the line of action of the weight with a dotted line. So the weight is acting vertically down this way. And to calculate the moment from that force, I need its perpendicular distance to the pivot. So I need the distance from this point uh, to here at 90 degrees. So it's this distance that I'm interested in. And actually, as you can hopefully see, that's 1.8 minus 1.3 gives me 0.5 meters uh, for my perpendicular distance. So this should be 0.5 and if people went wrong that tended to be what happened uh, and that gives you 1.7 times 10 to the 4 and then obviously it's a moment this time so it's going to be newton meters so you get one mark for this stage of working and then one mark for the answer with the unit as well uh, i might switch back to dark green actually <laughs> just feeling choosy okay so Part II, a concrete block is positioned on the other side of the support post with its centre of mass, a horizontal distance of 70 centimetres from the centre of the support post. And it asks you to state what is meant by the centre of mass. Uh, a lot of people also got this one a little bit wrong just because of their use of language rather than a misunderstanding, I think. Uh, so... Obviously, in an object, the mass is distributed throughout the entirety of the object. But in physics, we use the concept of a centre of mass to approximate all of it to uh, be acting from one point. Uh, and that allows us to do uh, calculations a lot more easily. So the issue is that people didn't say it's where it's considered to act from. They said it's where it was, and that's not, not the reality. So you needed to have said the point at which all of the mass of the object is considered, and I'm going to underline that because it's important, uh, to act. Okay, uh, so part two, the weight of the concrete block produces a moment about P that exactly cancels, that's important there, the moment caused by the weight W. So if it exactly cancels, it must be exactly equal in magnitude 
So even before I start anything else, I know from my previous part of the question that the value of the concrete block moment uh, must be the same, must be 1.7 times 10 to the 4 newton metres. Uh, I then also need to look again at the perpendicular distance. So I'm just going to scroll up. So the line of action of the force from the concrete block acts here. P is here, and so the perpendicular distance that I'm interested in is this one. Careful, because that's in centimetres, we need to make sure that's in metres, so 0.7 metres. Uh, so now I know that actually I have 0 0.7 plus 1.3, I have a 2 metre perpendicular distance. So I'm going to write perpendicular distance is 2 metres. I have the moment value. I know that the force, which in this instance is a weight, uh, must be equal to a moment divided by the perpendicular distance uh, and therefore that's 1.7 times 10 to the 4 over 2 and that's going to give me 8,500 or 8.5 times 10 to the 3 newtons this time because it's a weight. Uh, so the marking there will come from one mark for noticing that it's a 2 metre uh, perpendicular distance and then what mark for your answer. Okay, the last part of the question. Uh, this was the part of the question that was um, answered the least well by the year group. So, the concrete block is removed. The sign and support post rotates about point P in a clockwise direction. State, which means say, and explain, say why, what happens to the moment about point P due to the weight of the sign as it rotates. Now, this wasn't particularly well understood collectively by the year group, so I'm just gonna change color. I want you to imagine, because the P is still the pivot point in this case, the concrete block is removed, and so the sign will start to rotate because of its turning effect, because of the moment from the weight. So the sign is going to start to fall and I want you to think that as that sign starts to fall there, where the weight line will be will shift. But it's always doing that about this pivot point P. So actually what has happened is the perpendicular distance between the force, which is weight, and the pivot point has actually increased. So what we're going to say is we're going to state for the first mark the moment about P increases and that is worth 1. This is because uh, the perpendicular distance uh, from the pivot to the line of of W increases as it rotates and the explanation is also worth one. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you all now. Okay, for year 11 structured question 10, we've got figure 2.1, which shows us a model fire engine with its brakes applied. So those brakes are preventing it from moving backwards um, as it's firing this jet of water going forwards. So it tells us that 0.8 kilograms of water is emitted for, by the jet every six seconds at a velocity of 0.72 meters per second relative to the model. Calculate the change in momentum of the water that is ejected in six seconds. So what we need to have a look at is the total mass of the water um, and the total change in momentum that it has. So we're looking for the change in momentum, which is mass times velocity, or momentum is mass times velocity, but initially 
um, when it's in the fire truck it's got zero momentum and then 0.8 kilograms is fired out which means then it's fired at this velocity so the change in velocity of the water is 0.72 so to calculate the change in momentum we've got 0.8 kilograms times by the change in velocity of the mass which is 0.72 which then gives us 0.58 kilograms meters per second so there's two marks for this one is for remembering the equation and substituting it and the second mark is for the final answer with the unit for part B it's saying what is the magnitude of the force acting on a model because of the water jet so what this is saying is the force acting on the model so from the model firing the water forwards there's going to be a reaction force from the water on the model going the opposite direction to calculate the size of that we can use what we've calculated in part A so we know that the force is going to cause a change in momentum on the water and so we know we're going to get an impulse or a change in momentum and an impulse can be calculated as a force acting for an amount of time so in this case we are looking for the size of the force so what we're going to do is rearrange this so that force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the time taken now we know that the change in momentum is 0.58 kilograms meters per second so we've just calculated that and we know that the time that it takes is six seconds so we've got 0.58 divided by six and we know it's a force so it's going to be newtons so our final answer is going to be 0.096 newtons for the size of the force now it says the brakes of the model are released state and explain the direction of the acceleration of the model a lot of people in this question or this part of the question didn't talk about the acceleration and a lot of people referred back to this bit of the force going back on the truck so the acceleration is to the right or backwards so the model is going to move to the right or it's going to move backwards as the model's orientated now the explanation part of this is because and it's the direction of the acceleration um, the acceleration is going to be in the direction of the force so you can say acceleration in direction of force um, and it's the direction of force we have already stated here because it's the direction of acceleration of the model another way of thinking of it is that the force from the water on the model is going to be to the right as we identified earlier or the force um, from the water so not on the water but from the water being ejected this way is going to result in a force going this way so the force from the water is to the right for part D it's asking us 
Oh, it's telling us that the model contains a water tank which is initially full. State and explain any change in the magnitude of the initial acceleration if the brakes are first released when the tank is nearly empty. So we're going to be keeping the brakes on whilst the liquid is reducing being fired out so that the truck initially isn't going to move until let's say it's down to half the water until its mass has been reduced. Now once those brakes are released that's going to then cause an acceleration because the resultant force in the water or there is going to be a resultant force to the right. Now we know that F equals MA and so if the mass has gone down the force is constant the force comes from the water being ejected and we know from the water ejected the change of momentum and we know the size of the force um, so the force is constant so to get a constant value here if the mass has gone down the acceleration must go up so the acceleration and it must be in our statement the acceleration increases because from our F equals MA the mass is less so for constant force the acceleration increases and that makes sense in terms of um, the few examples that we talk about in class when we're talking about empty and full shopping trolleys if you apply it a force to a small mass is going to accelerate more than to if you apply the same amount of force on a large mass. So talking about shopping trolleys, when you're at the start of a shopping trip, the mass is small of your shopping trolley because it's empty, and then by the end of the trip, um, it's full of produce. And which one is it easier to get moving? It's easier to accelerate, so to get moving the trolley at the start when it's got the least amount of mass okay that is about it for question 10 okay question 11 figure 8.2 shows the connections to two logic gates and you can see the diagram there uh, table 8.1 shows part of the truth table for the arrangement of the logic gates in figure 8.2 complete the table for the input values shown now the whole of column D being correct is worth one mark, the first two rows of E and the last two rows are also worth one each. So that's where the marking points came from. Uh, it was The question was done pretty well. Uh, the students that got it wrong I think just haven't remembered which the log logic gates are um, and therefore uh, not getting the marks. Uh, so you can see that we have an OR and an AND gate. So, for an OR gate, either A or B need to be 1 for the output to be 1. And for the AND gate, both C and D need an input of 1 to give an output of 1. So, you should hopefully be able to see that A and B lead to the outcome D and then C and D lead to the outcome E. So A and B both being zero going into an OR gate means that the output will be a zero because neither of them are one. Uh, you've got a one for B for this second row, so you'll get an output of a one because it's an OR gate, and both A and B are ones, so therefore you have ones there. So you should get one mark for zero, one, one, one. Uh, so then you're looking at C and D and looking for where you have both of the inputs being one for the output to be one so that's only these two and therefore these are zeros so it's pretty straightforward you just need to make sure that you've memorized uh, your logic gate truth tables for, to be able to do that one